Market to Market is everywhere you are. Subscribe to Market to Market on YouTube, find us on the PBS video app to stream on demand, and add our three podcasts on your favorite podcasting app. Coming up on Market to Market, mixed signals on the recovery of the economy. Dry conditions in the West renew an old debate. We will, we will have to see. And market analysis with Ted Seifert, next. Understand, the dollar index is... What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. This is the Friday, May 14 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Paul Yeager. Doors are swinging wider as vaccination rates move higher and pandemic restrictions are lifted. However, the excitement of cash in hand from the economic stimulus appears to have faded. After rocketing 8.9% higher in March, retail sales were flat in April. Sales of clothing, sporting goods, and books pulled against increased car and auto parts sales. Without the auto sales, the index rose eight-tenths of a percent. The consumer price index increased eight-tenths of a percent in April, the sharpest rise since the height of the Great Recession in 2008. Without the price swings brought on by food and energy, core CPI moved nine-tenths of a percent higher, the biggest monthly jump in nearly 40 years. Economists have been looking for any indication of rising inflation in all of these reports. As the economy begins to heat up, it's causing indigestion in more than one analyst as they sound the alarm over the loss of purchasing power. Peter Tubbs has more. Household inflation rose by the largest percentage since 2008 as consumers returned to the marketplace, only to find the products they want in short supply. The 4.2 percent increase over the last 12 months follows a smaller increase in March. The inflation numbers may be exaggerated due to the baseline numbers from a year ago are from the bottom of the economic contraction caused by COVID-19 shutdowns. The consumer price index, which is heavily weighted towards shelter, can move dramatically even with small changes in the market for both purchases and rentals. More than 40 percent of the index is related to housing. Food is the second biggest component, which is weighted at 15 percent. The index for used cars and trucks led the way with a 10 percent climb in April, the largest jump since the series began in 1953. Automakers have slowed production due to a shortage of microchips, sending new car buyers into the used car market. The price jumps for autos account for one third of the overall increase in inflation. The cost for shelter, airline fares and recreation all had a large influence on the price index. The energy portion of the index did not factor in the increase in gas prices due to a pipeline shutdown in the southeast. The food index rose 0.4 percent in April, following a similar rise in March. All six major grocery store sectors experienced increases in the last month. Fruits and vegetables saw the biggest jump, followed by dairy and meats. Prices for food eaten out of home also rose 3.8 percent as restaurant traffic picked up. Energy prices fell 2.4 percent in April, which dampened the sector's 25 percent climb over the last 12 months, the largest increase in a decade. Gasoline is up 50 percent over the last 12 months as driving habits return to their pre-pandemic norms. This week, AAA reported the average price for a gallon of gas cost $3 surpassing the mark for the first time in six years. Analysts expect the climb to continue. The price of diesel fuel has increased 30 percent since its pandemic recession low 12 months ago, but is the same price as April 2019. The cost for shelter rose 2.1 percent over the last 12 months. Housing, both rental and owner occupied, constitute the largest segment of the price index and household budgets. 
home building of all kinds has lagged population growth in the United States since the 2007 burst of the housing bubble, and current building projects are hampered by a spike in lumber prices. The Federal Reserve believes that the increase in prices will slow in 2022 as producers catch up to consumer demand and COVID-related supply chain snags are smoothed. It may take longer to reopen a $20 trillion economy than it did to shut it down. When we shut down big parts of the economy last year to deal with the virus, that put substantial but largely transitory downward pressure on the price level. And reopening the economy is putting some upward pressure uh, on the price level, and we will need to be attuned to the data and following it uh, closely. For Mark to Market, I'm Peter Tubbs. Just about every indicator of drought is flashing red across the West. Reservoirs are being drawn down, river levels are dropping, and soils are drying out. And it's only May. The Departments of Interior and Agriculture are preparing for a fire season that is a year-round issue as wildland blazes are burning longer and hotter. I spoke with sixth-generation producer Denver Pugh from his western Oregon farm in Shedd about the coming growing season. It's up, but I, um... They don't have the numbers on head, but we are behind on average rainfall. It came in early last fall, which was always nice, but then went away about uh, late winter, um, which usually we get a, a two-week window break in February, and that's right uh, about the timing for us to put on our first application of fertilizer, but then it rains again, washes in. Uh, then, it, then we usually get a little bit of a dry spell in April, but then we always hope we get the rains coming back in May to help finish the crop up. And it's been relatively dry since about the second week of March. <laughs> so we are we're definitely looking in our drought situation right now. Uh, we did have a little bit of a shower come through uh, over the weekend. Um, it was Tuesday now, so it was Saturday, um, Friday night, and uh, Saturday night, we had a little bit of shower. We had about three quarters of an inch, uh, which is nice for the spring planted crops, but it's not near what we need to carry things through our summer. I'm really hoping through the month of May into about the second week of June, uh, hopefully we can get at least another two inches of rainfall. Uh, if we can't get it in that time frame, our yields are definitely going to suffer. So, but right now, yeah, right now I'm looking at partly blue skies. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, and a, ni a nice light little breeze. So, well, the drought tonight. monitor, the drought monitor says, in the way I look at the map, you're in the D1 category to them. It says some fields are left fallow, water levels begin to decline, recreation and other uses impacted. Now, soon, if you get into D2, which you're kind of on that area, uh, pastures are brown, hay yields are down. Uh, prices are up. Producers are selling cattle. Again, accurate? Yes. No, I, I'll agree with all of that. So um, it's funny is I'm in a uh, predominantly dry land area. You know, we don't, not many of us have irrigation, but over the last 10, 15 years, you're starting to see more and more wells being put in. Um, yeah, pivots going up. There's uh, in my area, that's like, which is, used to be kind of unheard of. And uh, maybe one day I'll jump on board, but right now I just, I'm, I'm still, I'm still praying for my rain. <laughs> well, um, you're a dry land producer, so no irrigation, no pivots, uh, like you said. Um, you don't get to sixth generation if that's not been a successful plan. I mean, obviously the rain has fallen from the sky over time to keep your family operational. Exactly. And, and really another thing that helps is my diversification. You know, I'm not growing just one species of grass seed. You know, I've got four different species of grass seed we're producing, plus the other four rotational um, crops. And all of, them deter uh, all of them depend upon rainfall, but all of them have a certain requirement, a different requirement for rainfall. And, and then the pricing structure is different on, on each one of those. So, so basically, yeah, if I, if we have a drought year and uh, yields suffer, well, usually price can correct for, you know, to, to make me back in, back in line financially, what I need to be to survive. So, um, so yeah, so usually 
in, unless we have multi-year droughts, um, I, I usually feel fairly comfortable. So, I, I mean, the irrigation thing would be nice. I, I'm not going to lie. It, it, it has thought crossed my mind about, all right, do I need to be following suit, putting in, um, punching in wells or trying to find it, you know, find water rights to be able to do it. It's, it's getting harder to do it. And, you know, one thought was babe, maybe I better jump on board now before I can't do it anymore. But, but like you noticed, or noted, six generation of doing this without irrigation. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I guess that's not forefront on my mind. I, it yeah. is in the back of my mind for sure, but it's not something I'm going to run out there and go do. So, How would you rate the needs of an Oregon producer versus other states' needs for water? And how ramped up has it become in the last 10 to 15 years? Boy. Uh, <laughs> how do you answer that without sounding arrogant? Um because, yeah, I want to say that we are very important. You know, we need our water, and we do. You know, but do livestock producers, you know, that rely on water to, to water their pastures so they have food for their cattle, do they need it more? Probably so. Um, I'm not going to deny that. You know, so there are other areas of the states that definitely need more water usage than what I need here. Um, but at the same time, we all kind of rely on each other. You know, if they can't uh, use cattle or have a marketable product, you know, or get their product to market, well, they're not going to buy my product to help feed their next generation. You know, so we we definitely rely on each other. So it's it's almost that you know, all right, what came first, chicken or egg? You know, who who gets it? You know, who who deserves it better? I that's a that's a tough question. Dan Pugh is this week's MTOM podcast guest. Watch the full interview on our YouTube page of Market to Market. New episodes are released each Tuesday. Next, the Market to Market report. Another volatile week of dramatic price swings on weather and USDA reports, which may have sent the longs to the exits with dramatic sell-offs in three of five days this week. For the week, July wheat fell 55 cents, while the nearby corn contract plummeted 89 cents or 12 percent. Beans remain in the teens, but predictions of near trendline yields and rain in the U.S. dropped the July contract by four cents. July meal lost 23.30. July cotton shrank by 723 per hundred weight. In the dairy parlor, June class three milk gained 44 cents. A mixed week in the livestock sector. June cattle dropped 73 cents. August feeders improved 687. And the June lean hog contract shed 412. In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index increased eight ticks. June crude oil added 53 cents per barrel. Comex gold gained 990 per ounce. And the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index dropped almost 10 points to finish at 513.50. Now, here to provide insight is regular market analyst Ted Seifried. Hello, Ted. Hello, Paul. USDA report this week. Yeah. Was there a winner? Was there a loser in, in that one? Uh, obviously, corn was the big loser. Yeah. Right? New crop corn, in particular, the big loser. Um, We'll start with the corn conversation. Uh, the trade, for the most part, was looking for a 1.3 billion bushel carryover. I think we had been factoring in something maybe even slightly smaller than that. The USDA gave us a little over 1.5 billion bushel carryover, and that's not especially tight. And it, it's kind of hard to justify $6.40 corn at a 1.5 billion bushel carryover. Now, there's going to be a lot of people that say, okay, the USDA is lowering exports 325 million bushels from last year to the new crop. And since the USDA did these numbers, we've seen China purchase a little over 5 million metric tons. Now, if you give the USDA a chance to do their export number again, would they raise it? Maybe. I don't know. I'm not going to argue with that. Um, but then you have to say, all right, when we looked at planting intentions, you know, we were talking just under 92 million acres of corn. Um, I think the trade, for the most part, really thinks it's going to be a lot closer to 94. Right, two and, to three million. Yeah, in and, fact, we yeah. saw, you know, a private estimate on, on Friday with 96 million plus. So 
There's going to be more corn acres, very likely. The weather has been good for that. Uh, if you look at what prices of corn have done since December, verse, December 1st, December corn versus November beans since December 1st has had an unprecedented precedented rally against that November bean contract. So if we're getting anything in acres, which everybody seems to think there's, there's more acres out there, it's going to be a lot of corn. So even if I bump the exports, the increase in production on those acres probably offset that and then some. So we could easily start talking about a 1.6, 1.7, 1.8 billion bushel carryover in corn. And then, oh boy, we have a problem. Now, there'll be others that say, well, a 179.5 national average yield is three bushels over the record that we currently have. And with the dry conditions that we have out west, it looks rather unlikely at this point that we're going to hit that 179.5. But, mm, it's really early to say that. And... Yes, you have an improving weather forecast, which was a big part of why we saw weakness early in the week and then again at the end of the week. But that weather forecast changed as it was early wet for next week. Now it's kind of dried up a little bit, and that's what we'll have to deal with. So I'm going to stick with corn, and I'm going to ask a question a little bit about the rally. And this one comes from Drew in Bayport, Michigan. He's asking, is the big corn rally done for now until pollination weather comes into play, or is there still enough strong bullish factors to get us back to the 630, 640 range. Well, so done for now. I, I like how we're saying that. Because, um, yeah, I think, I think so. I, you know, I think this last USDA report and a 1.5 billion bushel carryover is sort of a game changer. And now the idea that, okay, we're going to have more acres. That doesn't mean that we can't have a weather market and get us back to those highs, towards those highs, and possibly even make new highs depending on what weather does during the growing season. But it's really the soybeans that I am interested in. And, and it, I feel like this is a broken record because I feel like we were here the same time last year and I was saying the same thing. Uh, but the potential for tightness in the soybean balance sheet for new crop is tremendous. And I really feel like there's a lot of upside potential there. Yeah, and that was the discussion after the report this week was every bean bushel is accounted for, every corn one is nah, whatever happens. So do you see it that way too? Yeah, I mean, you know, We've been, t we've been doing this for the last four months on panels and individually where I've said we were never really in a position where we had to price ration demand for corn in a very big way, like we did have to do for soybeans. Right. We were never completely running out of corn. We had tightness in a cash market because uh, end users were worried about what was going to happen towards the tail end of this year if our exports had kept up. and. We had a very strong basis. So there were reasons to rally corn, but we were never really in danger of completely running out of corn uh, unless China had kept buying old crop supplies. But at this point, we kind of see them more canceling than anything else. So again, the soybeans have a much different story. It's not the same for corn. All right, I want to one last bow on, on corn. 14. 15% on December corn. The, the question, you, you just said you like the for now, um, but is this an elevator shaft that goes down a long ways and what stops, what, what can we grab a hold of if we're heading down? Uh, you know, we still have to grow this crop, yeah. right? And, and so there are weather concerns, even though, you know, we just talked about, I think it's early for that and improving, you know, longer term forecast kind of eases some of those concerns. But we're gonna be on edge because we really can't stand to have a significant yield loss, even with, uh, you know, if you want to call it 2 million acres additional. So we are going to be on our toes for weather. You just saw China bought 5 million metric tons. If that trend continues and we have to start raising that export number pretty aggressively, then we have a ball game. So there, there, there are definitely two sides of this coin right now, and you're going to continue to see very volatile markets. I think just the way it acted on Friday, uh, it seems like there's might maybe a little bit more downside in corn left here. Okay. We'll see how far that goes. But yeah, no, we should see a nice bounce here at some point too. Soybeans, volatility there, but we finish almost even. We consider four cents even for the week. Yeah. So the soybean, you've, you've laid out the scenario of it being extremely tight. Mm -hmm. I would expect more volatility. Yeah. What am I missing? Well, I think up until about a week ago, or maybe 10 days ago, we had really kind of forgotten about the tightness in the soybean market and what the potential could be for next year, too. We were very focused on South American weather, Brazil, Safrinic corn crop in particular. We were very fo focused on tightness in the cash market for corn, and we were really excited about the corn market. And soybeans kind of got forgotten about a little bit. 
But in the last 10 days, when we started putting together our numbers for this new crop balance sheet and analysts like myself started releasing them into the wild and people were saying, oh, at a trend line yield, we're projected to have 130 or 140 million bushel carryover for next year. There is a razor thin margin for how much we can lose, which is really nothing. We can't lose any of our soybean production. So our weather market, unless there is a major demand destruction event, we stop doing business with China. China invades Taiwan and we say, okay, China, no more, right? Something like that, ASF travels throughout the world. I, there's a couple of things that could happen from a demand destruction perspective, but if those don't happen, we have to have a trend line yield because I'm not seeing a huge increase in soybean acres. And if we have anything less than trend line yield, we have a negative ba balance sheet. And this is all, I mean, keep in mind, the USDA's balance sheet at 140 million bushel carryover for new crop, that's including a 205 million bushel reduction in demand for next year. If that reduction is not accurate and we have similar demand or improving demand from one year to the next, we already have a negative balance sheet. Yeah. So the soybean story could be potentially very, very interesting. Which wheat is following which one? Corn, soybeans, or is it setting its own path? Traditionally, it has to follow corn more. Um, and that's really what it's been doing. I think towards the end of this week, you had wheat really wanting to wait and see what happens on the wheat tour next week. I mean, we are very curious to see if there Hard was winter frost, demand right. or yeah. winter kill, yes. Damages, yeah, damages and, and, and what the recent rains have done to improve. And it's the first real kind of idea we're going to start getting about yield because up until now we've just been sort of guessing at what all these, all these conflicting factors for the wheat growing season have accounted for or uh, come up with. So, yeah, but I, wheat will continue to follow, follow corn more than anything. All right. Uh, livestock market, uh, live cattle. Uh, there's a discussion about maybe there's not enough labor to process the animals. Packer making a lot of money. People asking, why aren't we talking about this? Are you talking about, Let's talk about packer this. margin? I've been is, talking about this. this is, what are you saying about it? It's frustrating, right? Um, the cattle market right now is frustrating because I don't think it's accurately reflecting fundamentals. Uh, again, domestic demand is really very strong. We didn't have a great export sales number this week. But for the most part, again, domestic demand is very strong. Consumers are willing to pay higher prices. We talked about inflation. Inflation's running rampant. And people are willing to pay ten dollars to $15,000 more for a car than over MSRP. Sure, they're going to pay 2 or $3 more for a steak. Packers' margins are really fantastic. They complain that because of the stimulus and everything like that, we can't get guys to come in for work. But when your margins are that good, you can afford to pay these guys more money to get them to come in. But if they did that, that would cook their golden goose. That would really hurt the massive profit margins that they have right now. So they're perfectly happy blaming COVID, blaming stimulus, blaming workers for not fixing the problem, increasing production, paying up on cash, and pushing both the cash and the futures higher. It's really frustrating because, again, there are times where I feel like the cattle market is disassociated from reality. And I feel like this time right now is maybe stronger than one I've seen in the past. And again, we're using you know, this, the, the global pandemic and, yeah. and things like that as an excuse when really it's packers that are having fun with the market. They're trying to get their way and they're succeeding. The, the feeder market went up a bunch this week. Yeah. Is that all on lower input cost or is there somebody seeing optimism that they think something's going to cycle out and they're going to time this right? Well, I think both. I think there is optimism in the feeder cattle market. But to your point, yes. I mean, corn was down 86 cents or so this week. That helps things a lot. Um, I will say, though, it was a little disappointing on Friday that we didn't see feeders a little bit stronger. Right. But we had already bounced a fair amount off the lows. Technicals are kind of negative here for the moment. Um, but yeah, live cattle struggled at the end of the week. The cattle complex has been frustrating because again, I think we are a little disassociated from reality there. We had a gap in the hog market. Yeah. Is that top in? Hmm, I have concerns about that. Um, I'm not gonna say that yet. Uh, I'm still optimistic that uh, we have more upside potential. Again, domestic demand is really good. The whole inflationary idea, I think, is still in play. Uh, it doesn't seem to be as many animals out there as we get into the late spring and into early so summer months. So I like that August contract a lot. But I am on high alert from a technical perspective. I don't like what I'm seeing in hogs right now. Is there technically any of the three livestock markets that you do like? 
if I have to choose one, it's the Hogs. From a technical, from from a chart perspective, if we can hold here, it's been a very nice rally. It's just like the grains. You know, we've had a correction. Everybody wants to kind of panic on that. But if we, the fact of the matter is, if we hold support and turn around, then that chart looks really good again. From a fundamental perspective, I think the fundamentals are there for cattle to go quite a bit higher. But we've been frustrated that it hasn't been able to do that for quite some time now. But when you get frustrated, I can tell. Yeah. All right. Hey, guess what? I got the whiteboard. Ready to have fun on Market Plus? Let's do it. All right. Thank you, Ted Seifert. Appreciate the time. That will do it for this installment of the TV show Market to Market. We will talk more in Market Plus. We just talked about we're bringing the whiteboard out, so we'll have fun with Ted there and answer your questions. Find that on our website of markettomarket.org. School may be winding down for the year, but the learning never stops in our classroom project. We have modules from business, history, to the study of commodities. Click on the classroom tab the next time that you visit markettomarket.org. Next week, we look at a year of struggles for one hog producer. Thank you so very much for watching and have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa PBS, which is solely responsible for its content. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today.